because he had, had missed him so badly. So yeah, there's never closure. There's never closure when it comes to losing um, a loved one to me. Um, there's, there's healing, yes. Um, but there's that that never goes away. That pain never goes away. It's it's with you, twenty four seven. Particularly as a parent and as a child, you know, um, it just never goes away. Birthdays, holidays, you know, it's just like Renee said. You close your closure on a house on a on a uh, you know payment or something. You can find closure there, but never when it comes to life. Never. There's no such thing as closure in my book when it comes to that. Um, let me ask you a question while I'm here with you, Maddie. What what would you what, what kind of advice do you have for people that um, that experience the you know murder? That I mean, it's it's something that's unbelievable to say out loud. Like it, so it's it's such an a, assault on your life, on your psyche, on your heart, on your everything. So, what kind of advice do you have for people on how to get through this and how to um, come out the other side hole. Well, I'm going to give the advice that I didn't get. Um, being an African-American mother whose son was murdered during a time where I didn't get a lot of j justice. I didn't get my, the DA wasn't there. No one in the law was there for me, except for the, um, my inspector, Inspector Bergstrom, who's the only one that came to me and you know, gave me peace and serenity and took me by my hand and took me to the place where my son was murdered. All those different things he did for me. He 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 cared that much, um, but it was treated like another murder. Oh, it's just another black boy killed. What the hell? Uh, no one, If I felt like, where was the, the justice system? Where was the DA? Where was, you know, where was it there for me? So the, the racism and the bias that I experienced and mm -hmm. losing my son, you know, and then my community who saw and didn't say anything, you know, that, that too was a double-edged sword. You know, I got hit so many directions when this happened to me from my community, from not speaking up, saying who did it. And, you know, they arrested this guy. They had him in, they had him. And then they had to let him go because why? No one came forward to, to say anything that he did it. So they couldn't say he did it, you know. And to me, they could have done more and kept him. But to me, they didn't do it, you know, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black mom and it just, just happens too much in my community and who gives a damn. So that was one thing. And then the, the criminal justice system, you know, the DA, like I said, wasn't there for me, no one. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight like hell to make sure that this doesn't happen to another mother or anyone else. I don't care what ethnicity they are. We, I, I work, I pay taxes. My dad served this country in the military. My mom worked, I shouldn't be treated like this. And so it, that was all so heart wrenching for me. And, I, and that's why I'm the advocate and the activist that I am today because I know, you know what you go through is just so demeaning. You know, even in newspapers, you know, they put, oh, just another, drug dealer. My son wasn't a drug dealer. My son wasn't this. He wasn't on anything she said. How dare you put this in the paper about him? You don't even know me. You're going to come and tell me, put this, uh, penalize and traumatize my family even more. So my family was traumatized over and over and over again, over repeatedly from the law enforcement, from the, from the media, from everything, just reach traumatized. And so that's why I worked so damn hard to make sure that this doesn't happen to any family. You know, any mother, you know, I don't care if your daughter was a prostitute, they shouldn't have put that in the paper like that about her because she was murdered so brutally. And, you know, and then another prostitute was murdered. How dare you? This is someone's child. This is someone's daughter. You don't do that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm I, just, um, you know, adamant about making sure that we do the right thing and that we change a broken, very broken criminal justice system that's biased that's um, not fair, doesn't, uh, you know, that's not fair to people of, you know, unless you're wealthy or, you know, someone, I, I looked at when John Bonet was killed, all the media of that guy and all of that. And that was so horrible for a little girl to die like that. But then I looked at all the people in my community that got killed. Nobody took the time to do nothing, you know? So that's why I do what I do. And I'm gonna continue doing it so we can change this broken system. The more we tell our stories, mm -hmm 
the more Rennies, the more you, the more us, the better that we can get to the root cause and change this whole broken, biased criminal justice system to make it better, even when it comes down to the death penalty. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go over to Rennie, but I do want to, um, just for our audience to, to keep in mind that um, not only is the death penalty um, racist in application against the perpetrator, against, so if you are a person of color, you're more likely to be charged with capital punishment. But if you are a person of color and you are the victim, that crime is less likely to right. garner a, a, a death sentence. So there's a lot of the criminal justice system that is absolutely racist in application. Renny, I'm gonna come over to you and ask you the same thing. What is, you know, what have you taken away in this time? What do you, what advice do you have? How do you, how do you help people navigate that are going to find themselves, unfortunately, you know, none of us thought before that moment, before that moment, yeah. we all re remember when we were given that news that um, for me, there's a before and after. There's a second when I lived before that and then the second when I lived after that. And it's all, they're two totally different places. So go ahead and tell me what. Where well, I are. think part of it is just figuring out how to get up and get out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. to be a survivor of homicide victim. It's got, it's a pain for which there, there really is no other name and trying to do that. Um, and it's little by little. That's the only way that you can possibly survive. And you have to be gentle on yourself. Um, and you have to be gentle on, your, on those who also are, 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 have been impacted by murder. I mean, one of the things that's really sad is to see how families get torn apart over the death penalty, over the, you know, who, who've had somebody murdered because some members of the family will like the death penalty and others won't. And it's kind of hard to have that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to reconcile the two. You can't have both an execution and, a, and, a, and keep, give someone life. So that is, uh, is diff that's difficult. Um, but I think we need to really have a change in our criminal justice system. It's right now, it's mostly about winning, losing and punishing. And I think it, what it needs to be about is, um, is about truth telling and, um, and healing. Um, which is there's not much about about our criminal justice system that augments well for the ability for individuals or a society to heal afterwards. You know, um, it's kind of a weird game that we all know that prosecutors play sometimes with with uh, defense attorneys and to, to, you know defendants play with uh, victims' families, and it's just uh, it's not it's not an ideal situation. I don't know if that's responsive, Beth, to what you want to say or not. But. No, I think, you know, um, it brought a different, yeah, I, there is no playbook, I don't think, because we no. all, you, nobody ever is told the day before, hey, this is going to happen. So, you know, there is the, I think both of you hit on the, the fact that the first thing is to get up because the um, physical assault, the, everything that makes it, almost for me i think there was about a month where i couldn't feel anything i couldn't even really cry i felt like i was walking in place um that i was i and i'm a i'm an emotional i cried a sad hallmark commercial but i couldn't find you know i couldn't find that i felt so um I, I, i'm tapped numb. Just, yeah not numb numb, numb. Right? Like, and I know people would throw their arms around me and say, I'm so sorry. And I, at one point, remember thinking, I can't feel anything. I can't mm -hmm. feel. And then the other side of that coin is when that emotion finally hits, when the numbness wears off and you are gut punched to your knees, um, that you have to find a way to come back to life, to remember joy, to remember, to see children laugh, to see your children laugh. I, I, um, I know, Maddie, you have other children. I, it was my sister, but I was raising kids at the time that were her, her godchildren and, and trying to explain to them, you know, um, this is what happened to somebody that was so much a part of their life. It's, it's very, you know, it's, uh, unbelievably difficult. Um, so I think we're gonna kind of, there, we had a couple of questions come in that I wanna ask you about. Um, 
when, hold on just a second. Um, whoop, my phone just came. Um, when the, the relationship with law enforcement on, on either side. So have you, Granny, I'm gonna tar start with you because you've done a lot of this work and you were, uh, you had a relation, I mean, you, uh, you had a good relationship with the district attorney at that time. Um, do you find that your relationships have changed when people, when district attorneys or prosecutors find out your position? Um, you know, somewhat, I, you know, that's because I think prosecutors have a hard time with the cognitive dissonance with the, the notion that all family members of murder victims don't want to see someone put to, to death. I think, you know, they come from a culture that's pretty much pro death penalty and pro hate. So when you, but what we come to realize is that, you know, there are lots of different positions people have on the death penalty. Some people support it. Some people oppose it. Some people support it sometimes. Some people don't. Some people don't know what they feel about it. Um, I'm fortunate in that I continued having relationships and doing work in New Hampshire to abolish the death penalty so that the person who prosecuted my father's killer was the person who stood by when the, um, the when, you know, was there with the, when, the, when we overrode the governor's veto who would, you know, had that kind of continuity of a couple of decades together. And um, I don't know if I know this answer, but it just crossed my mind. Is he still alive? The yeah, he's- Rennie? Yeah, yeah. Yes? yeah. Stuck in, okay. in jail somewhere in Florida. It's on the exchange plan. And um, I'm gonna ask you that too, Maddie, is the, Young man, that, well, he's an older man now that got to have a lot of life. Your son didn't have. Is he still alive? And the young man is still alive. Um, I'll tell you a story that's really that's why I love this work, um, and I believe that the work that we've done has brought um, law enforcement, the law enforcement community, more closer and more respectively. Um, together um, to provide better services for, for victims and their families. But anyway, I was doing uh, with Jean O'Hara. I was uh, victims of uh, I was an advocate for um, friends and families of murdered victims under Jean O'Hara at San Bruno County Jail. And in that class, the majority of the people that's in that class are inmates who perpetrated or done violence. And here I am. I'm the speaker for the day, for that day. And who's in the class? Who do I see? The young man who murdered my son. Yes, yes, I get. Mm -hmm. I see him, and he saw me, and um, he, when he saw me, I was talking to some of the other inmates and talking to, you know, about because you know you have to pass your pictures around, and he saw my son's pictures and he saw the pictures of his children um, that I was passing around and before I began to speak, and he got up. He, he looked and he put his head down and he got up and he walked slowly out of the classroom and did not come back. And mm -hmm. um, I went ahead. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell because of confidentiality. I didn't tell the group who that he was in the room. I didn't tell anyone anything about him. I just was there to tell my story and to tell and educate these men of why it's so important for you not to pick up a gun or to harm or take another life. I made them think about their own families and their own children and why violence is not the way, no matter what. You shouldn't allow anger. But yeah, he, he uh, to, to this day, have not been uh, charged with my son's murder and um, has been in and out the, the criminal justice system. You know, and like I said, I was chipped with a double-edged sword because I seen all the work they did for other people to keep, you know, um, to, to when they found out who 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 killed um, certain folks, um, like Katie Stanley, you know what happened with that situation, and other other folks, how they went all the way to find out who did it. But yet you had this person incarcerated, and you let him go because no one came forward. That you, to me, you didn't do enough. You didn't mm -hmm. do enough. Um, you know, and I'm told that he's possibly have shot other people. Um, this 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 uh, same perpetrator that has shot someone else. Um, and he has a, you know, he has an, a, a drug problem. And I'm just, I just, like I said, I know his mom and I, I see her and um, I see the other, the other young man, the other young man's mom. 
I used to see her in Safeway all the time and I couldn't understand why she was cry every time she would see me. She would cry every time she would see me and, she would, and I would say, I don't understand. But I found out why, because her son came home. Her son was there when my son was murdered. And he came home with all of my son's blood all over his shirt. And, and, and um, his mom had never been the same. And so when I saw her, the last time I saw her in Safeway parking lot, when I got home, I got a phone call. His mom had a heart attack and died at, mm. in, in the store right there. Cause, and I know it has something to do with her seeing me, you know, because she, she, she was carrying that load. She's carrying that burden, you know? So yeah, mm-hmm. I uh, definitely believe the work is so valuable and so important for us to, you know, it's a sacrifice, it's a commitment, it's hard, it's not easy, but it's part of my healing. It's part of my healing journey and I have to do it. If it's going to keep another person from killing someone, I, 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 I'm there. I'm going to share something and then I'm going to go to Rennie too for a final comment. Um, something that I have held in, in, in my heart, um, that the man that murdered my sister went into the Salon Meritage where she worked um, to kill his ex-wife. Um, and so when he was asked why he killed everybody else, he said they were collateral damage. And I think we have to understand Um, Part of death penalty focus is work and the abolition work is for people that are innocent. I mean, we are talking uh, now about people that murdered the people and we know that, but I've met so many um, really wonderful people that were convicted that did not, that have been released. We know people have been executed that were innocent. And when I think about that, I met uh, a guy and I met his sister. And when he was on death row and they were prepared to kill him, his sister was trying to, was living with the idea that somebody was going to murder her sibling. And I felt such a connection with that to say her brother would have been collateral damage. If you support the death penalty and you understand that innocent people are going to be executed, then you support collateral damage. And I'm the sister of collateral damage. I'm the sister of somebody that was murdered because somebody else deserved to die. And so many people say, well, if we get most of them, the couple that are innocent, it's okay. Well, no, no collateral damage isn't okay because it's devastating to to the families of that collateral damage. Renny, tell me me your final thoughts on, on what what we need to know, what we need to do, how we can really reach people and explain to them that this is should not be done in our names. You're not I, doing it I, I think I think we need to explain the, the, the complexity of the death penalty system. We need to um, talk about how it fails to meet the needs of anybody, really. It's, you know, even in theory, you thought it doesn't work for victims. It doesn't work for law enforcement. It doesn't work for victims, survivors. It's just a broken system that uh, the longer that we continue to perpetuate this idea that we can fix it, the longer we're going to be doomed to frustration and failure and, um, you know, and, and, and not get on with kind of the real hard work that needs to be done to, to fix the system. I think that's I, I think that's right that that the death penalty is done um, in my case the after they cheated and if you're not familiar with the Orange County informant and the Sobeat Salon shooting um, there was the district attorney and, and and the sheriff's department in Orange County cheated on our case they um, they withheld evidence they used an, an informant which brought up the informant scandal. And what that did was that spent, we spent six years traumatized in court. So, um, Renny, what was, how long were you in court? I mean, and how, how? Years. Years. And, and, and it's, the mo- it's, it's the motion sickness. You know, there's always, a, there's, a, you know, appeals that go on at the state level, the trial level, the appeal court level. But um, yeah, a good four years of, of solid, intense. Uh, litigation around the murder itself and the first go around. And I was somewhat fortunate uh, can, when I know the sad stories of other people who've been strung out for even more longer period of time than that. Okay, um, I'm just gonna ask for your kind of your, and we're gonna try to keep it at two minutes. Um, so your, um, your final thoughts on um, 
maybe even not just personal, but why the death penalty doesn't work, what we can do, what people can watching can do, how we can make make it, it, a difference, like what we went through, what we lost, how, what your life's work. Sum your life's work up in two minutes, if you could, please. <laughs> Uh, Rennie, we'll start with you. And then oh, we'll no, I, I, I think it's a challenge, but I also think it's a great reward in some ways. Um, I am honored to be able to work with the most amazing people that you could possibly imagine, all of whom have had the most unimaginable pain foisted upon them and somehow struggling to make it through it, to work every day to try to make this world a better place for everybody. I'm inspired by everybody on this phone call, and I'm inspired by the work of Death Penalty Focus. And others who like that, who are doing the hard work every day. There's no shortcut. There's no easy way forward except forward. Thank you. And I am in awe of you. I know I told you that your work and, and can I say, can we get a little round of applause for the decades of work Rennie did and finally got New Hampshire to abolish the death penalty. So there is, I mean, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it can be done. So we just now need to get California because as California goes, so does the rest of the country, even though 31 states have beat us. <laughs> yep, we'll take it right down. That's great. And, and okay, Maddie, can you go with that? Tell me in a couple of minutes where, what we can do, what do you hope for, just what your final thoughts are. Well, I, my final thoughts is, you know, we could do more because we're a country and a nation that, you know, well, we live in a free society, so we have more access and more, more um, ability to do it. But yet we're the most violent country in the world right now to me. More people die here of gun violence and, and murder than anywhere else on the planet. And I think that we could change this around um, fix the broken criminal justice system, um, you know, pay for young people who want to go to school to be lawyers or, or um, prosecutors, people, young people of color who can't afford to go to law school, provide them with education, those who has the heart for it and not in it just for the money. Many people say, oh, I want to be a lawyer because it's money. I want to be a prosecutor because it's money. No, get those who want to do it from the heart to really change the system. That's where it's going to pull down the bias against women and people of color. And um, so education is key. Education is key to me, but also um, come and bring it to come to the table with everybody at the table, having a seat at the table with your voices. That's the biggest thing. Demanding a seat at the table and demanding to be heard. Um, I love Project Innocence. I did work with them in San Quentin. We have a group in San Quentin called No More Tears. These are all former perpetrators and men who committed acts of violence and many of them murderers and they're now out doing the work with us. They're mentors they're, because they've turned their lives around. They went as young men who, who didn't have the proper guidance, who was caught up in the system. And now um, because of education, because of healing circles that we do, because of education and advocacy, these things are changing. We're changing it, um, the dynamics of this. Um, and so I believe that it's about all of us or none of us, and that we have to stop the killing and start the healing and in every direction. We have to stop the killing and starting the healing and education and our bias and our schools and every every area of um of our lives. We have to do that because right now we're killing each other on every and every and every aspect, no matter you know where, where you look. And I think that I'm, we're in it to win it, and together we will. And together we can. Thank you. I'm going to read something. I'm going to read a question, not actually a question, a statement that came over that. I'm um, so excuse me if my voice trembles when I say this. Um, it, it says, I'm so glad that the victim's family members are using their voices in this fight. As a mother of a son who was executed, in September 2020, I can tell you that witnessing his premeditated murder by our government was the most difficult thing that I've ever endured. My son's death certificate indicated that his manner of death was homicide. Mm. Let, that, let that sink in if, if you can, folks, because wow. you're, you know, Rennie, Maddie, and myself have a moment in our life where 
we witnessed the murder of somebody that we love. Imagine now what that would be like to be given that time and date and not to be anything to be able to do anything about it. We have to be better than the people that make the worst decision at the worst moment of their life. We have to be better because otherwise we are just them. We're just them, but we're not going to jail for it. No, and this is about all of us or none of us. It has to be. It has to be about all of us or none of us. And uh, we have to change the whole mindset and look at what, what hasn't worked and, 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 and still not working. So, but I have faith that we, there's a formula and we've proved that today with all of us and everybody that's here. We've proved that, that uh, the formula can work. Okay, Maddie, other Maddie, I think I'm gonna send it. I first just really from the bottom of my heart wanna tell um, Maddie Scott and, and Randy Cushing that how much I look up to, how much I, my heart goes to your heart as a mother. Um, that and as a daughter or you know that that parents sisters children um what we've been through and, and that you've been able to come out the other side and done this really important work i you are my heroes so thank you thank you for having us thank you for having us it was wonderful yeah thank thank you i add my thanks to all of you and add beth and abigail who was having technical difficulties and couldn't be on the call, we're sending her, um, sure it was frustrating, just lots of um, love from us too. And to thank everybody for being here, for asking questions. We're sorry we didn't get to a few of them. Um, if you wanna learn more, um, please, you'll, we'll send you a note tomorrow or the next day, probably the next day with some resources about Maddie Scott's group and Abigail's group and uh, more about death penalty focus. Uh, we um, the, we just are appreciative that of the time that you took. Um, we will. There will be another uh, webinar in this series uh, during the first week of December entitled "The Death Penalty Brutalizes Us All" with different uh, people who have a different relationship to the uh, to the death penalty. People are also actors in the system. Um, and so we look forward to that. And clearly we could have gone on for a long time about this tonight, um, but we really are grateful for your uh, time and attention. And I think that's it for tonight. Uh, we wanna wish you well and um, Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.